The phrase American culture is a bit of a misnomer, for as this year's presidential election has shown, America has many cultures, and some of them really seem not to like each other. For the past 35 years, San Francisco writer and journalist Richard Rodriguez has been a keen observer of how various American cultures seek power and affirmation through the political process. And he joins us now for his take on what's behind the astonishing election, the outcome of which Americans will finally, finally decide next week. Mercifully almost over, right? I think so, except that, I mean, there is some speculation that the loser will not go quietly and that his... <laughs> what makes you say that? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, the, de the depth of grievance in America right now, mm -hmm. particularly among white men, um, is large. And the, the, the support that Donald Trump has among people who come from a broken America, mm. where manuf the manufacturing jobs have left, and the sense that it's gone to somebody else, whether to migrants who have come in and have undercut them at the, at the construction site, or whether it's gone literally to Vietnam or Mexico or mm. China, and we are left with nothing. That I'm, grievance is deep. I've never questioned the sincerity or legitimacy of that grievance. I have been extremely curious, as somebody who watches from north of the border, how a billionaire playboy from New York somehow is the champion of all of those grievances. Well, I, it's part of the irony. I mean, partly, we, we've never, I, I think it's the, I've lived part of my life in London, and I remember the working class always used to say, when they saw Rolls Royce going by with them, some uh, very fancy people, they would always say, I'm going to get that guy and get him out of his car. Mm -hmm. uh, in America, somebody goes by with a fancy car and everybody says, someday I'm going to have a car just like that. They and, used to say that. Well, Donald Trump still has, because of his vulgarity, mm -hmm. still has the possibility of, of convincing us that he's an everyman at the same time that he's a billionaire, although we don't really know what we he's We don't really know. We're, uh, we're going to pursue more of this as we continue our conversation. First of all, welcome. I haven't even welcomed Thank you, you yet. Thank Hi, you. welcome to uh, Toronto, Canada. Um, I do want to talk about, first of all, a bit about Barack Obama. Um, and I want to know whether you think America truly is better off after eight years of Obama. I think it's not exactly delivered. On the other hand, I think we're more used to this idea of a brown press. When he was elected, I wrote a piece for Newsweek. Um, which I said, we, at last, America has its brown president. Of course, in America, the, the nuance of that, that, a, that a, 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 an African-American who might also be the son of a white woman mm. is too difficult, and he became, in, in the public understanding, a black president. I think, in some way, America is used to that now, in some way. But there is also, uh, what shall I say? I don't think he delivered on the large thing, hope. I don't think that, that the country feels itself improved by his presidency. And his signature legislation, uh, Obamacare, is, is, has been, has, is collapsing. It's in some difficulty it's now, in some, isn't it? And there is, there is some sense. I'm not, a, I'm not an analyst of, of the world this way, but that he and Hillary Clinton, as the Secretary of State, went into Libya and committed the same crimes, it seems to me, uh, for justice. That I, I said crimes for justice that uh, President Bush had committed in, in, in uh, Iraq, getting rid of a tyrant, getting rid of the monster, and not preparing for the vacuum that follows that. Oh. If you get rid of Gaddafi and you don't prepare for the world after Gaddafi, it seems to me that you're inviting a kind of chaos. Uh, okay, let's talk Trump. Let's talk some more Trump. The call to stem illegal immigration from Mexico by building that wall and having Mexico pay for it, you know the deal. That got Trump off the ground. Did you get the sense from the beginning, from the beginning, that that potentially represented a winning platform that could take him as far as it has? I didn't know that Americans were as afraid as, as they are, apparently. Mm -hmm. That's the sense of being sort of threatened by the world. Uh, maybe this comes from having uh, the world turn against our ambition to control it, but that the, that the Mexican would be this figure of threat to the, to, to the American consciousness. What, what Trump doesn't mention of course, is, and I've worked along the border with TV crews, and I know that the border is very dangerous, um, uh, that we have, um, as Americans, a drug uh, habit second to none in the world. Mm -hmm. We will stuff it up our nose, put it in our veins, we'll do anything to get, to, to get high. Mm -hmm. We can't get out of bed with it. We can't go to sleep without it. We, we don't mention what our addiction has done to Mexico. Mm. how we have turned these, the little runt at the corner into a billionaire who has his own private army, his pr private jets, private uh, uh, boats. That, that inability to describe what our influences on Mexico 
and merely to describe what Mexico's influence is, is on America seems to be a, a crucial failure of Trump. That, that in, in other words, he sees America as a victimized culture. Hmm. And, it's, and it seems to me a, in some way a, a kind of old man's lament that look what they're doing to us. I always say uh, now to people who say, well, she'll be our first female president if she gets elected. I see her as the end, the, the last rather than the first, in the sense that beginning with suffrage, she, the, the, the struggle of women to become members of the bo uh, school board, become mayor, become governor, become city councilwoman and so forth. This has been a long progression. Mm -hmm. And she makes po she she's possible because of that progression, and she it seems to me that she, she culminates the the progress. But I see her to be um, a kind of strange figure. Not, not, there is this. I'm not getting into the question of whether she was an enabler to her husband's mm -hmm. sexual misdeeds, but there is certainly this quality about her that she at the at the moment of her ascent, we are seeing so many men in a kind of sexual meltdown. Not only Donald Trump uh, grabbing at women and so forth, but her own husband, who's been accused of rape and so forth. Um, and we're beginning to talk about this line of politicians from Jack Kennedy on, of, of, of Danny Hester, uh, who was uh, in, in the, the Republican run the House, Speaker of the House, who's now in jail for having molested teenage boys as a wrestling coach. Mm. It seems to me that there is something quite odd about the, the predicament of the male uh, grabbing at women, insisting on, 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 on some access to their breasts. Mm. And then there is this woman, Hillary Clinton, who has survived in a kind of sexless bubble with her assistant, Uma Abedin, who's who's her own problems. who has her a husband who's sexting mm -hmm. and uh, pictures of his genitalia. She's there on her cell. I don't know whether she's talking to him or or to their child who, who's being raised by the father. What, what that sexless ambition is, at the moment that we are watching this kind of sexual meltdown of the male, is very, very interesting. Is this part of the reason you think Hillary Clinton's decision to stay with her husband in spite of the Monica Lewinsky business, is that one of the reasons why she, despite being potentially the first female president ever, just doesn't really connect with women of a younger generation in a way that you would think that the first female president ought to. I, no, I don't think so. No. I, think, I think that it, it wasn't that so much, because I think the young people I meet don't even think in these terms anymore. There is such sexual promiscuity in the world. <laughs> but I think it is that um, she, she, her, her campaign has been largely focused on the middle class. And there's, there's, here comes a socialist out of the state of Vermont talking about of the world in classical leftist terms of the haves and the have-nots, uh, who himself is even possibly the forbidden word in America, a socialist. And that <laughs> the students responded to. It had nothing to do with mm -hmm. his sex life. It had everything to do with this, this call to a conscience about the poor. Hmm. Um, and I think that the, 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 the idealism of young people in America was touched by a man like that in a way that Hillary Clinton has not touched them. Bernie Sanders you're talking about, obviously. Yeah. Um, I, let me go back and do another follow-up uh, related to Libya, because Hillary Clinton seems to be, well, first of all, she seems a lot more, if I can use this word, muscular in her foreign policy approach than Barack Obama is. And she seems to evoke the kind of Golda Meir, Indira Gandhi, Margaret Thatcher style of foreign policy, which was a lot more in your face uh, than some of their male counterparts were. Uh, have, have you sort of figured out her where this muscularity in foreign policy comes from? I don't know. I, and the reason I don't know, and this is going to sound like an anti-Hillary statement, mm -hmm. is that uh, I, I'm not a banker for Goldman Sachs. <laughs> and she's, she's in the habit of giving yeah. speeches behind closed mm -hmm. doors to, to, to world bankers and telling them about her global enterprise, her vision of North America, of the borderless uh, union of Canada, Mexico, and the United States, this impossible union, which her husband also pr proposed with NAFTA, um, and she would never have said that in public. So I think that there is a kind of, there are several Hillary Clintons, mm. and I think some of the bankers know some things that I have no idea of. I don't know, you know, I don't know what she knows, of what she's prepared to do as president internationally. I do think that she, um, she sees herself as, a, as a, a figure of change just because she, uh, I don't think of her as Margaret Thatcher, but just because she brings in a kind of, a new 
energy into the mm. into the into global affairs. You are you're from California, yes. where the population is about the same as Canada's, and where is it fair to say almost half the population is Hispanic now in California? Yes, roughly. Roughly but half. Those are not the famous people. Those are not the movie stars. <laughs> They're not the scientists in Silicon Valley. You have to say that we're washing the dishes, we're 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 mowing the lawn, and uh, we are we're a society on the make, perhaps. But we make California possible because we're watering your garden, right? And your your our, our friends from Canada come to they say, oh how beautiful all of this is. <laughs> well, we made it possible because we watered it. But uh, we are not the we're not the California of the of the billboards they, and of the travel. They said the posters. same thing about the Italians here 50 years ago, who basically built the city we're sitting in right now. In any event, uh, do you? I mean, you're a man of Hispanic background. Do you feel a heightened sense of? Um, xenophobia out there towards Hispanics because of the Trump phenomenon? I, d I, d uh, I do and I don't. I mean, partly when you have so many Hispanics in California, by which I mean Mexicans, largely, and Central Americans. I hate the term Hispanic, but it's because it doesn't tell me anything. Uh, but uh, I don't, I mean, it's hard to feel xenophobia when so many people are marrying into each other's culture. Um, mm. And so many, you know, without Hispanics in America, the, uh, the Christian churches would be in decline, as they were in, as they were in Europe. Mm -hmm. The Catholic Church is in numerical decline, except for the fact that the immigrants are coming, and that that their influence on our spiritual life is enormous. Nobody talks about any of that, of course, because they're described as people who are bringing criminality into the country, when they're bringing the exact opposite. They're bringing a kind of spirituality. That energy that is coming into the country, that that they take care of the children when the wife is already out doing her career, that they're taking care of the old people who are dying mm -hmm. because their, their children are no longer caring for them. That, that stability that they're offering California is so deep and so domestic and so much a part of everyday life that xenophobia has almost mm. nothing to say about it because and they're already in the door. They're already mm. in the kitchen. They're already, you know, as Arnold Schwarzenegger, who's making love to his, to his, to his uh, House, household uh, housekeeper housekeeper um, you know that that drama is mm. is not that far fetched and his son now from the, this new Tom Jones on the make in 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 Venice with his father building his muscles you know that's the new california you mm. know this 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 child of, of illicit but true love and propping up the economies of central america by sending remittances back there's that there's and, that too yeah. um, and bringing uh, optimism the country is, as I just described, is afraid. America is afraid. And the immigrant keeps bringing optimism to the country. And they're not rewarded for that optimism. They're not rewarded for the fact that they feel lucky to have a job slaughtering chickens mm. uh, or, or having a job uh, changing your grandmother's diapers. They feel lucky to have that job and blessed for it. And that, that, that energy, that optimism, which I see as classic American, but always imported by the immigrant. It's funny, the, the 58 year old white male who used to be in a manufacturing position but now hasn't worked in years and years and years, doesn't feel that same kind of optimism but, but may actually have a better life than that Hispanic maybe, person. Maybe, maybe, but I do know my nephew has restaurants in the Bay Area and he hires Mexicans, but that's not even the beginning of it. All of the Mexicans come from certain villages in central Mexico. The, that's just the way it is. And what, when he needs somebody, another dishwasher at that restaurant, all he has to ask is the, the, the old man in the, in the village. Mm. And there's a new one there. So if I'm a Mexican from Veracruz and I come looking for a job, I'm out of luck. If I'm black or white and uh, American born and I'm looking for a job, I'm out of luck because it's, just, it's a closed system. You understand? Mm. The people who have paid the price for open borders, if that's what it is in the United States, has largely been the white and black um, mm. Underclass. Let me let me follow up on that. The American Hispanic population, I think, is about seventeen percent. The American Black population is about twelve percent. Uh, since you just referenced the two of them in the same sentence, I should ask: How well do you think these two communities are getting on right now? Bad and good. Uh, there are kids in LA. I can introduce you to them who call themselves Blacksicans. Uh, Blacksicans. Yes, they I are. Heard that they before. are. The, there is eroticism everywhere. Hmm. <laughs> and there are children who now are making up their own names because there are, there's no, I, I, there, there are Negro Pinos in, in Pennsylvania. There are uh, 
a Hindu is now in, in, in Colorado. I met a Hindu the other day. A Hindu meaning half Hindu, half Jewish? That's right. Um, the, 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 uh, there's an eroticism in America in the middle of all of this sort of talk of division and competition and conflict. People are falling in love. They always have, okay? But the, 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 really, the threat that, um, that the Hispanic or the Mexican represents to America is that we're introducing a category of culture or ethnicity into a country that has always been obsessed by blood, mm. by race. And we're, we are not a race. Although people think of us as a race, Hispanics now are seen at a, at a, on a chart along with black and white. But we are also white. There are many white Hispanics. There are many black Hispanics. And there are many, as I am, a mixed race Hispanic. But the United States can't deal with that. They, they, we are sort of impersonating a third race. And do we threaten African Americans? Yes, because we are introducing this notion that maybe we are beyond race. Hmm. Maybe culture is more important than blood. Uh, maybe religion, food, um, grandmother's uh, stories, whatever that the ethnicity is carried by has a force that is more powerful as a unifying force than, than, than blood. Hmm. So that there are these enormous television networks now in the United States like Univision, for example, mm -hmm. which advertise themselves as Spanish language. And the language itself is the power, not its politics. The language is the politics. You watch that, you watch soccer on Spanish language television, mm -hmm. not because the television angles are that much better, but because it's, it comes to you within that linguistic familiarity. Mm -hmm. That notion of culture is still very new to America. And the, 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 the recognition of what the Hispanic represents to the country is underestimated because we, they, we, we are not a threat to the racial breakup of, the, of, of black and white, but we are an evasion of it and therefore a creation of a new understanding of culture. Let's uh, finish up on this last topic. If I've heard this once, I've heard it a lot of times over the last six months, and that is Americans threatening to move to Canada. Maybe seriously, maybe not, but you hear it a lot. What do you make of that? Well, we have been moving here for a long time. During the Revolutionary War, those of us who were loyalists... No, I know, but that's uh, not what this well, is about. <laughs> well, during the Vietnam War, those of us who were, who were mm -hmm. against going to Vietnam moved here. But you that's are, not what this is about either. No, you are, you are a safety valve. <laughs> you know, Mexico, there was a Mexican official who said that Mex the, elite, the migration into the United States from Mexico was a safety valve because it was getting rid of all the poor people at the bottom. And so Mexico didn't have to deal with them. In some way, you have, you, because you're sane, because you're lucid, <laughs> because we think of you as calm and these notions, you know, this notion that you've come up with, Pierre Elliott Trudeau came up with multiculturalism, which is an absurdity, but it's a Canadian idea. It's like, it's like clean water. You it's know? an absurdity that's working pretty well, I hate to tell well, you. Well, but it doesn't make any sense because, yeah. because none of us are multicultural. I mean, I'm not multicultural. There are certain behaviors toward women that I do not approve of and that I do not accept as, as, as legitimate in our society. I, Mexico has a different notion, which is the mestizaje, the notion of m the mixing of races. Mm -hmm. That is literal mis uh, miscegenation, literal erotic energy in history. And Canada is this lucid society that we're going to respect everyone and so forth. Who wouldn't want to go to Canada? It's like this Disneyland for, for senior citizens <laughs> where we would all be nice to each other. In Mexico, everybody is falling in love with each other and having sex, and it's chaos. Mex Americans are eating Mexican food at the same time that in the classrooms we are trying to convince students to be Canadians. The, in the American classroom, everybody talks about multiculturalism. The kids go out to the schoolyard and they become Mexicans with each other. They start flirting with each other. They're in love. <laughs> you know, if you ever get tired of San Francisco, you'd be very comfortable here in Toronto. I oh, just I'd want to let you know. No, I know it, but yeah. it's getting kind of crowded. I'm meeting a lot of Americans <laughs> up here. <laughs> Richard, it's so good to have you here at TV. I could talk to you all day, but sadly, our time is up. Thanks so much. Thank you. Help TVO create a better world through the power of learning. Visit TVO.org and make a tax-deductible donation today.